Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. Hope you enjoy. Gift Exchange, written by Random Isocahedron. Arrival confirmed, all systems functioning with normal parameters. Captain Uriot relaxed slightly. Despite hundreds of jumps, she still found the process disconcerting. Excellent, Oren. Begin the system scan. Oren pushed a few buttons. Active sensors are running. The nearest substantial object is 20 light minutes away. We'll have a complete pass of data in under a minute. Good. Reorienting and preparing to burn. Ah, uh, something is on passive scanners. Small asteroid installation at the innermost planet's L2 point. Biologicals on board based on temperature. And there's a ship with a half a gigawatt reactor burning towards it at a tenth of a G. This is a small system. So we're both around three light hours out. Do they have any transponders? They are transmitting some signals, but the computer didn't recognize them. Let's see. Oren pressed a few more keys. Oh, the Terrans, using their new protocol. The station doesn't have a name, and the ship's called the Pickup Truck. Weird name, even for Terran standards. Uriat looked at her own console. Are they, um, allowed to be here? Under the Treaty of Kepler 1649C, this area is freely accessible to all. As long as their so-called government hasn't tried to stop them, they have as much right to be here as we do. Well, I suppose we should tell them our intentions. It's only polite. She spoke into the computer, which translated the message and transmitted it. Greetings to the, uh, pickup truck. This is a trade ship Dalinar of the United Syndicate. We are moving at half G and expected to be leaving the system in 520 hours. We are transmitting our full planned trajectory. Please advise as the closest approach. Around four hours past two minutes of message composition later, a response arrived. Greetings, Delanar. Closest approach will be 140 hours. We'll be three light minutes away from you. We're doing some light construction work here, but it shouldn't be a concern. And, uh, please stand by for a personal message. Personal message? Do they think they know us? Maybe. They want us to carry a message to someone else. It's fairly common in backwaters without dedicated courier ships. The message came through a few minutes later. We can send you some provisions if you like. We checked it, and it should all be compatible with your biology. Oren looked at Uria strangely. Is this some sort of insult? Are they implying that we didn't bring enough food? Uria responded thoughtfully. I don't know, perhaps, but perhaps not. Cultural exchange has been maddening slow. Due to their, um, the idiosyncrasies. I think it would be in everyone's best interest if we assume it is meant to be a friendly gesture. Tribute? Oh, symbolic trade. They might expect something in return. We could send them some of our own food, maybe. Hmm, maybe. The pickup truck came to a stop relative to the station and gently let go of the large ice ball it held. Inside, two children floated in EVA suits, grinning broadly, although you couldn't see the grins through the mirrored faceplates. All right, you sure you two are comfortable doing this on your own? Of course we are, Dad. They responded through the crackling radio. Okay, just remember I'm right here if you need anything. He hugged them, although they didn't feel anything through the semi-rigid suits. They flew, or perhaps wobbled proudly into the airlock, which he cycled. Outside they flew around, placing tokens to target the pickup truck's laser, and then polishing up the small comet with hand tools. A few hours later, they pushed the many-faceted pieces of ice into position with careful bursts of compressed air. Once it was exactly right, they fastened it to the steel framework with lengths of braided carbon nanotubes. Returning to the pickup truck, they doffed their suits before accepting several more hugs. You did very well, called their great-grandmother, and the ivy is growing quickly. By the way, that ship contacted us. Well, uh, what happened? Oh, it's a syndicate trade ship. Anyway, grandma, sorry, my grandma, started carrying on about ping pong, so now we're going to bake them some treats. The kids didn't know what ping pong had to do with the passing trade ship either, but they liked baking, especially since it meant that they had a taste of few ingredients beforehand to make sure that they were still good. They always were. 15,000 kilocalories and pies, cooking, puddings, and other delicious things were carefully packed into padded boxes. The boxes were lowered into a small pod, which was affixed to a hastily modified torpedo. It was fueled as its flight plan was transmitted to the Delanar. Delanar could well package launching in T-4 hours. They expect 8 Gs of acceleration, full flight plan attached. Well, that is certainly some very fast goodwill. 
Aaron studied the flight plan carefully. He looked at the attached data for the package. He double and triple checked. Captain, they're firing a torpedo at us. Uriad processed some words which no civilian captain wishes to hear. There was a danger, but Uriad couldn't see it. So her eyes instinctively moved apart to spot the threat or prey, an utterly useless adaptation against torpedoes. She brought them back to her console. Notably, no sirens were sounding. None makes you think that. He simply pointed at the attached flight plan, and then at the entry in the ship's database. This goodwill package is precisely the same size as a TOS-10 Pylum hybrid torpedo, and the acceleration profile matches perfectly. It carries a one megaton fusion warhead that would wipe us out instantly. Uriot was remarkably calm. Can we evade it? A pause, some calculations. Yes, it is guided by the ship that launched it, so even at the closest approach, we could be moving away for 24 minutes before it could react. And on the trajectory, the best time to evade has nearly an hour of light lag. It wouldn't even get close. Then why would they even bluff? They'll figure that we'll think that it's their provisions and let it on board. Then, as it approaches, it blows up and we die. A large, thin sheet of freshly mined aluminium, rolled into a millimeter thick, was manually placed in an acid bath and anodized. It was then removed from the acid bath with a purpose-rigged crane, carefully washed and dried, and placed into a pile of like sheets. Look, Aria thought aloud. They're humans, they're crazy, and they're giving us a torpedo, just so that we could have a nuclear bomb in our workshop. It's entirely within character. Humans might think that's a reasonable gift, true, countered Oren, but their military wouldn't. And if they have torpedoes, they are military, or at least closely liaised with the military. There's no way they'd just hand us the hardware that they were so recently shooting at us. Harriet skimmed the database entry for the TOS-10. It says here that they have replaced it by the TOS-12 during the war, and now the TOG-15 and the MSO-7. It's not modern kit. Still a torpedo. It was modern until a few years ago. If we had one, would we send one on the main battery lasers from the Larani just because we have better ones now? Uriot had to admit that this was a good point. A boy in a mini tug carefully maneuvered the aluminium sheet into position, whereupon his two companions in spacesuits began riveting it onto the steel frame. Once it was securely fastened, he flew the tug back to the station hub to get another sheet. The thing is, if they are being honest about this being a gift, but they are sending it via torpedo for unreasonable reasons, we can't straight up evade the gift. That would be an enormous insult. You're seriously worried about insulting the people who might be trying to kill us? No, I'm worried about insulting them if they're actually not trying to kill us. And the thing is, the pickup truck's laser power far exceeds our navigational shields rating. We saw it cutting up the comet, although fates only knows why. And with that reactor, I doubt that their shields would even notice our micrometeor lasers. If they wanted us dead, they could kill us in a far more straightforward way than this weird deception you suspect them doing. And they'd get to take our cargo too. Even if the deception is highly unlikely, falling for the deception is much worse than irritating some humans who probably hate us already. Plus, ship-to-ship -ship combat could be a plan B if a clean surprise kill doesn't work. Activating the EVA thrusters, another person exited the airlock carrying a box of xenon arc lamps. They had propelled themselves precisely to a selected spot and a bolted an arc lamp on the framework. Once it was secured to their satisfaction, they moved a little over a meter and attached another arc lamp. What we need is a way to distinguish between deceptive Terrans and crazy Terrans. How does their behavior change if they are trying to kill us versus them being friendly but mad? The words hung in the air as both thought about it. Horan spoke up. If they're deceiving us, they'll be more suspicious of our own actions. They'll worry we're planning the same thing. If they're friendly, they'll probably think that we're friendly too. Clever. So we need to do something that would see seen as friendly if they are friendly, and seen as hostile if they're hostile, and then watch what they do. So send some provisions of our own then? Yes. But not just that. It has to look like a bomb if they're looking for one, but look like a gift if they're not. Also, it has to arrive before their torpedo does. Well, uh, we have a catapult for, uh, basically just that. Handling off small payloads without slowing down. So, we just have to prepare a package which looks like a bomb, but only if you already think it's a bomb. An old man in an EVA suit, holding a chemical thruster with a fuel tank, surveyed the diffuse laser array. The batteries were nearly full, and there was no visible damage. He spent 20 minutes checking various delicate components, and then satisfied. 
Use the rest of the fuel to burn back towards the asteroid station. Wearing thick gloves, Uriet placed the spent fuel pellet canister in a box. Oren added some ration bars, a few bottles of sweetened starch slurry, and their day's rations of fresh plant matter. There we go. It'll set off the Geiger counters, but who waves a Geiger counter at something they fully believe to be a gift? What if they ask us about it? We'll say, oh dear, we put that in by mistake, and we'll know they opened it inside without scanning it, so we can trust their own package. Good, that works. The box went into a small transport pod, and then the pair returned to the cockpit for launch. Oriot grabbed the radio. Pick up truck, this is Delinar. Launching reciprocal goodwill package in T-minus five minutes. Expect high launch velocity and a 3G suicide burn on approach. Full flight plan attached. Notably, the package would have already launched by the time the Terrans received the message. That would have no way of weaseling out of the plausible excuse. The Dalinar's engines shut down, rendering Uriat and Oren weightless. Buying control thrusters rotated them about 120 degrees to aim the catapult. The catapult's rails telescoped out five times the Dalinar's length, and then the fine control thrusters made even more of minute adjustments, carefully aiming the package. A light flashed in the cockpit. Oriot and Oren simultaneously tapped their keys to sensors to the opposite sides of the cockpit, and the package launched. The officer of the watch pressed a button to input the flight data to the pickup truck's navigational computer, and the radar beam automatically began tracking it. Attached to the flight plan was a message explaining that it was a package for them. Diplomatic matters went beyond the officer of the watch's powers. A superior had to be contacted via intercom. Mom, the trade ship decided to send us a gift. Can you help me translate a message to thank them? Oriot and Oren watched the transport pod's telemetry intently. Two humans in vacuum suits caught the pod and began guiding it towards their spacecraft's main habitation module. No one would ever do that if they suspected a bomb. The relief was palpable. Should we open it now? Yes. Let's see what they gave us. No. We should wait until the big party. No. Let's just open it now. They'll be expecting a response. Let's get everyone else here first. The 18-strong crew of the pickup truck, most but not all family, eventually gathered in the hangar where the transport pod had been brought in. It was decided that the youngest should open the gift. It was discovered that the youngest couldn't figure out the clasp on the transport pod. It was determined that all the siblings were allowed to help. The pod was opened with a collective effort, and people immediately began taking things out and laying them on the table. There were various colors of snack bar. The translator proved to be hopeless at translating the flavors written on them, but they tasted good. Two bottles of what was quickly determined to not be wine, but rather something that was reminiscent of tapioca, an acquired taste, it was decided, and several fresh fruits. Precious, even on a station with a hydroponic section. The fruit was divided so everyone got a piece. They tried every part of it, and even the fibrous skin. It wasn't the greatest, but it was worth trying. And then, at the bottom, a fuel canister. The uranium oxides in it wouldn't work with the pickup truck's reactor or the stations, but they decided to accept the gift in the spirit of which, which it was given. Perhaps they could use it to make some model rockets or fireworks. A light-hearted argument over whether fireworks, which you could only safely observe indirectly, were worthwhile fireworks, was cast off by the demand that everyone who touched fissile material, yes, I know that it has cladding, wash their hands. The modified torpedo screamed towards the Dalinar, its rear graphite plate ablating under the pickup truck's laser. Once it was within 10,000 kilometers of its target, the laser cut. It ejected the remains of the graphite plate and its chemical thrusters brought it gently into Dalinar's airlock. A robotic arm grabbed it and brought it into the cargo bay, where, with a screwdriver and a minor amount of cursing, Oren was able to open the jury-rigged pressurized transport capsule. It contained several padded boxes of various baked goods, many of which had not been squashed by acceleration. There was too much to eat in one sitting, so they sampled a few things. Oriette's favorite was the caramelized spiced sweetbread covered in sugar. Oren preferred the dark brown balls covered with white shredded something. Their translator was having trouble with the food's highly idiomatic names, but that didn't stop them from being tasty. All the preparations were ready. With everyone floating in the observation deck, the pickup truck detached from the station and began receding at a snail's pace, so as to maintain microgravity. Still, they didn't need to go very far. Within a few minutes, the ship was turning, and within a few more, the entire spaceborne structure was visible through the window with an impressive backdrop of stars. 
It was time. A button two and a half meters in diameter, red naturally, had been constructed specifically for this occasion. Eighteen people pressed the button together. The arc lamps came alive all at once. The lasers activate a moment later, sending the light bouncing off a reflective five-point star at the top. Light twinkled over the many balls of ice which glowed and brightened in the shadow of the planet behind them. The genetically modified ivy covering the truss structure, definitely green despite the vacuum of space, completed the picture. It was, without a doubt, the best tree ever. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Lord Azrakal, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.